Phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black owned media and be skate. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? December 7, 2022, coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. Democratic Georgia Senator Raphael Warnock has won re-election, defeating Republican candidate Herschel Walker. We'll talk with Hillary Holly about how Warnock won the election. The United States Supreme Court could shift election authority in America. Tamia Booker will explain how this Supreme Court case could shape the way we vote in 2024 and beyond. Attila Jefferson's murder trial is uh, on day three, and Jefferson's sister, Ashley Carr, took the stand. We will hear testimony from Carr and how she's been impacted by this horrible tragedy. Patrick Lyola's family files a wrongful death lawsuit against the city of Grand Rapids, Michigan. We'll give you the details and update on that case. Plus, today on Tech Talk, we'll talk with the founder of Fanbase, Isaac Hayes III, about how Meta is suppressing your content and why you should be supporting black software develop, de developers. It's time to bring the funk. I'm Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the find. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics.
It was a big night last night in Georgia. We were there as Senator Raphael Warnock won re-election to the United States Senate, beating Herschel Walker. Today, Republicans are playing the blame game in terms of what went wrong. They are upset. They are angry. At 3.5 million Georgians cast ballots in the Georgia Senate runoff. Of course, he beat uh, Walker by about 95,000 votes. Now, Warnock had strong voter support in urban and suburban counties, flipping Baldwin County blue. Here is some of what uh, Senator Warnock said last night to his supporters. I want to say... <laughs> I want to say thank you to my mother, who is here tonight. You'll see her in a little while. But she grew up in the 1950s in Waycross, Georgia, picking somebody else's cotton and somebody else's tobacco. But tonight, she helped pick her youngest son to be a United States senator. My dad has long passed into the light but he is still very much with us. I watched my dad, a pastor and a small businessman, take care of his family by working really hard with his hands and using his brain. And he picked up old junk cars and loaded them on the back of a rig that the mechanisms of which he designed himself one on top of the other. And that's how he took care of his family. But on Sunday morning, the man who lifted broken cars lifted broken people. And convinced them of their value. I would not be here were it not for them. I am a proud son of Savannah, Georgia. A coastal city known for its verdant town squares and its cobblestone streets. Tall, majestic oak trees dripping with Spanish moss, bend and beckon the love of history and horticulture to this city by the sea. My roots, like the roots of those oak trees, go deep down into the soil of Savannah and Waycross and Scriven County and Burke County. I am Georgia. Now, Herschel Walker conceded the election, unlike Donald Trump, who didn't claim it was rigged. Yet he never addressed Senator Warnock by name. Uh, listen, listen to this fool. I want you to believe in America and continue to believe in the Constitution and believe in our elected officials most of all. Continue to pray for them because all the prayers you've given me, I felt those prayers. I want to thank all my team as well, Team Herschel, because they put up with a lot. I want to thank Team Herschel. Thank all my donors as well, because you guys, without you, I couldn't have done what I've done. So I want to thank all of you as well, because there's no excuses in life. And I'm not going to make any excuses now, because we put up one heck of a fight. And I said, that's what, that's what we got to do, because this is much bigger. This is much bigger than Herschel Walker. And I told, I told someone this the other day. I said, you guys, I've done a lot of stuff. Uh, you talk about Heisman Trophy, you talk about all the athletic awards, business awards I won, but the best thing I've ever done in my whole entire life is run for the Senate seat right here. And the reason I'm going to say that is I got a chance to meet all you and to hear what you guys feel about this country. 
and I got a chance to, for you guys to tell me what you do feel about this country. I got a chance to go into your homes, got a chance that you uh, invested in Herschel Walker, and I thank you, and I thank you so much. And as I said, you can't blame no one because uh, I want you to continue to believe in this country. Our elected official, and most of all, stay together. Don't let anyone separate you. Don't let anyone tell you that we can't, because I'm here to tell you we can. And I'm here to tell you we can. And as I said early on, this is, God is good, and he's a good God all the time. He's a good God. So I want to say I'm never going to stop fighting for Georgia. I'm never going to stop fighting for you because you're my family, because I always— Oh, I'm a, I'm a winner. Hey, we all winners, so we're all winners, and that's what I want to say. We're all winners, and I want to say God is a good God. God bless you guys, and let me tell you, stay together, continue to believe. No, Herschel, you're a loser. You took this L. Uh, his son uh, tweeted this out uh, in response to the loss. Christian Walker said, don't beat women, hold guns to people's heads, fund abortions, then pretend you're pro-life, stalk cheerleaders, leave your multiple minor children alone to chase more fame, lie, 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 say stoop of your family, and then maybe you can win a Senate seat. Well, now. Warnock is Georgia's first black uh, senator elected uh, last year. Of course, he was elected in a special election in 2020 to fill the unexpired term of uh, Johnny Isaacson, who, uh, who retired. Warnock will now serve a full six years in the United States Senate. Democrats now have a 51 to 49 advantage in the U.S. Senate, uh, which means they don't have the power share with Republicans now. Uh, they will control all U.S. Senate committees. Uh, joining us right now, folks, uh, to talk about how grassroots organizations uh, mobilize and organize the black vote uh, and others, uh, which, of course, was critically important uh, in this uh, election, uh, is uh, Holly. Holly, how you doing? Glad to have you uh, back uh, on the show. Uh, this is, uh, look, it, it was 90, look, a margin of 95,000 votes. So we're not talking about a lot. And what, I, what we kept saying, every single vote matters. That's what we saw. Um, first off, I just want to say thank you, Roland, for really taking the time to talk about the grassroots work that happened on the ground. I mean, literally, y'all, Tuesday night on November 8th, we all went to bed. The grassroots organizers went to bed because we knew early Monday morning we had to get right back to work. And because of the coalition led by America Votes, um, Black PAC, uh, um, let's see, New Georgia Action Fund, Unite Here, they literally had canvassers on the ground as soon as Thursday. And at that same time, Care in Action, New Georgia Project, the ACLU of Georgia, um, Southern Poverty Law Center, so many of the voting rights organizations were then also fighting for voter access because we knew that we were going to be able to get to the millions of voters needed because the grassroots organizers in Georgia are just incredibly talented and sophisticated. But we were like, when they get out to vote, we had to make sure they have not only the right information, but they have enough hours to get there. Because at first, Roland, the polls were only going to be open from 9 to 5. I mean, we had to sue uh, to get um, uh, Saturday voting. And so it was a monumental effort that was just really put on by the collective. And and without that story, like, we won't see the full picture of what happened here on the ground. Uh, I, I mean, absolutely. Uh, I mean, look, when we focus on that uh, from day one, that was critically uh, important uh, because, uh, look, uh, Governor Brian Kemp has a major get-out-the-vote uh, effort. He's the incumbent. Uh, he gave, he, he loaned that to Herschel. Senator Mitch McConnell's operation paid for it. They pumped $11 million into that ground game. He had some 100 field organizers. Uh, it, uh, probably, if we went to all the grassroots groups, uh, I doubt $11 million funded all of y'all effort. Uh, so... I it took some pushing, 
but we got we did in fact get there but it it took some push right uh, i mean and look i look i can tell you because the day same thing the day after the election uh, i sent text messages uh, and emails to a variety of folks saying we're ready we're not waiting uh, and um, like one group hit us 20 days later like hey let's talk and i'm going um, the elections in a week where y'all been you know and again we don't we understood at every day we were not on the ground, every day ads were not up, every day we were not engaging voters was a day we potentially lost. And that lawsuit, that lawsuit uh, to get early voting on the first day was so, so critical because, again, when you look at the numbers and you look at where they were coming from, they were coming from Democratic areas. And so this is why the legal battle, the grassroots battle, the fundraising battle, all those have to work together to, uh, to, to achieve a victory. Yes. And, you know, and the, the, the way that America votes make sure that we're talking to each other nonstop is also beautiful. So, for example, the New Georgia Project had this spreadsheet, Roland, of 159 counties. And every time that one county announced that they were expanding early vote hours to 7 to 7, or the second we started learning the polling locations that, gonna, that were going to be open on Saturday, New Georgia Project would then go and tell the coalition, hey, we just update our spreadsheet. And then um, people who were leading field um, and canvassing operations like myself and Black Voters Matter, and like I said before, Black Pack and Unite Here, we could then ping our canvassers and say, hey, this spreadsheet that you all have, this tool is now updated. So we were literally able to update voters in real time. And like that was really hard work. <laughs> and so I just I'm just so proud that we were able to do it and to be able to do it so seamlessly. Um, and because they they were close to getting it. But I always tell people the Georgia coalition and the Georgia organizers, we're just we're just built different. What um, in terms of looking at the data uh, and again, we were on the road. We were in uh, a lot of the rural areas. The Warnock people asked me to go to those places. Uh, and I was like, not a problem. We broadcast our show from there. And some of those places in the general election turnout for black folks was like 48, 49%. I saw one data point that said black, black turnout was 60%, white turnout was 65%. Have you seen anything like that to have an understanding of, of what the turnout was in this runoff? Yeah, and the numbers are astonishing. And it goes to show that we did what we had to do. So, for example, um, out of all Black voters who voted in this runoff, 5% of them didn't even vote in the general election. The same goes for young voters. Um, out of all the young voters who voted in the runoff, 11% of them voted in the runoff, but they didn't vote in the general. Um, same thing with Latinx voters, 6% of all uh, Latino and Latina voters who voted in the runoff, voted in, um, did not vote in the general, and Asian American, nine to 10 percent of the Asian American voters who turned out in the runoff, uh, they didn't vote in the general. So it was because organizations were in the rural areas, organizations like Amer um, Asian American Advocacy Fund knocked over 85,000 doors, all AAPI voters, they got their people out, even ones who did who sat out in the general. Latinx organizations like Galeo Impact Fund, Poder Latinx, Casa in Action, they did Spanish-speaking um, PAC activity to make sure that when they showed up to the polls that they voted for Warnock, because the right-wing disinformation was targeted them like crazy. And so we really showed out, and the numbers show it, too. Oh, I can't hear you, Roland. Talked about this last night with Cliff Albright, Latasha Brown, uh, and others. And that is, when we start, when we look at the numbers again, and I'm glad to see we saw those increases. But I continue to suggest that if we're able to move black voters from 60 to 70 percent, we could literally clear the board. 
So from a stra from a strategy standpoint, the election is over. Osof doesn't run again until um, he was elected in 2020. So that's 2026. Okay. 20 um, yeah. And so, and then of course, Warnock is 2028 because it's a six-year term. Uh, and now thinking about other states as well. Um, what needs to be done to, to move that, to go, to go from 48, 45, 50 to 65, 70? Because, again, I, 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 I fundamentally believe, and I tweeted this earlier, I, I believe there's a, there's a quarter of a million votes sitting out there that, dem that Democrats and black candidates can actually get and then you're not squeaking by in these elections. Uh, and so, uh, are you and others uh, going to be going through and examining the data and then saying, okay, what do we need to do to reach these people, to get them, to, to enlighten them, to educate them, and then get them registered, and then get them voting? Absolutely. And so this is, again, what people hear me talk about America votes all the time as if I work for them, but I don't. They're just a strong ally. So what we do, it's called um, post-election walls down conversations. They happen after we get the voter file and we do a ton of digging. And what, but what's great, what's most important that we talk about is what you're asking me is what we then do with that. And so, for example, right now, um, Care in Action, Black Voters Matter, um, all, all the organizations I listed, we are planning on not only moving um, Democrats in Congress to get more work done, but what we then have to do, Roland, is get right back on the doors and on the phones and the texts right. to then tell them what Warnock is doing and tell them what Democrats are doing. So, for example, one thing that I actually got to do in South Carolina, and I plan on doing it here in Georgia, is the moment that the, Bi that the Biden administration um, did their executive order around student loan debt relief, a lot of people were talking about whether that was enough or if they should have done more, which were all conversations that needed to be had. But what Karen Action did is I went straight to work. I went to my data team, and I was like, I need you to pull me a list of every single black voter that we know went to college at some point in their life because they probably accumulated debt. And once I get that list from my data team, my South Carolina team went and then called and texted and set up um, application um, tents at all these community events to not to tell them that they were most likely eligible for this relief. So we have to connect the dots. And luckily, we already do that here in Georgia. But this is another message to all the funders and the donors. We can't wait for this next wave of investment in Georgia to happen in 2024. We actually need it at the top of 2023. So when we go and get these wins, we can claim these wins, tell about, talk about these wins with our people, and also get them the money that they are yep. obligated to do. Uh, absolutely agree. Um, last point. I was, um, it's been a long day. Uh, we were on till midnight last night at a 620 flight to Houston today uh, for a meeting, then a 12 o'clock flight back to DC, uh, which got here four o'clock, just a couple of hours ago. And I was sort of thinking about, okay, 95,000 votes. And that's, 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 that's a, it's a good win, but it's still narrow. And then I was sort of thinking about, all right, if you're sitting a Warnock, now you have six years. How do you now redefine the map in six years? And, and what, what immediately hit me was, imagine if he decides to do what I call an annual, and I'm just straight, and look, at Lydie just hit me, um, an annual statewide town hall specifically targeting 12 to 24. Now, somebody watching may say, why would you target 12 to 24? Because whoever is 12 years old today is 18 when he runs for re-election. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think if, whether it's him, whether it's grassroots groups, or whoever, if they are fixated today on the 12 to 24 demo, in six years, they're 18 to 30. And now all of a sudden, so just imagine if, so imagine he's, you know, one location and they've got satellite locations, you can ask questions and whatever, and he's engaging thousands of folks in that demo.
discussing these issues in 23, in 23 and then 24, then 25, then 26, and then 27, all of a sudden, you're going to have a massive number of voters who are likely going to be backing you. Those white Republicans will be passing away. Uh, and so now uh, that's just sort of how, how, how I'm thinking in terms of how candidates, how a Warnock, how an Ossoff, uh, how even other Democrats should be thinking about engaging folks, preparing for this next cycle in 24, in 26, in 28. Your thoughts? I mean, this is why I appreciate you. I, I absolutely agree. And the infrastructure exists to do that. So when, remember I just said, 11% of all the young voters that voted in the runoff, they didn't vote in the general. That is explicitly linked to this amazing organization called the Georgia Youth Justice Coalition. They're black and brown led, and they're led by literally 18, 17, 19-year-olds. And not only are they organizing those people, but they're also organizing the freshmen and eighth graders to get politically involved. So when I'm thinking about the long-term investment, of course, I'm over here going to fundraise for Care in Action. That's the entity that I'm responsible for. But then I'm also going to point funders to organizations like that so they can then grow and expand like they held a conference in atlanta they had i think it was over 32 counties represented i'm talking 16 to 20 year olds none of them were able legally allowed to have alcohol so it's that combo new georgia project also has an amazing youth outreach program but then you but it, it takes all of it it's not either or Warnock does the same thing. One of the amazing things Warnock did in 2021 is when he wasn't in D.C., he was doing rounds in rural Georgia. I mean, he was getting press hits in rural outlets, rural radio stations, black rural radio stations consistently. But to your point, we now need to get a little bit more sophisticated, right? So when he's doing those rounds on the ground, talking about the work he's doing in Congress, he needs to also, you know, be on TikTok and other and, uh, and other places where the young people are. Or, or, <laughs> or actually, uh, what, what I've said, because uh, which was what which what we did for for the for him in 2020. Every time he had a rally, every time he had uh, something going on, we were live streaming it every time. And and and, and what I said is, y'all have to be thinking in terms of using your social media as if that's your own television. Your, your, your own TV outlets um, during the during the presidential campaign in 2016 and 2020, Bernie Sanders did that very effectively. Elizabeth Warren did it effectively. I was talking to the Kamala Harris campaign. And I was like, "What are y'all doing?" I even had a conversation with the person they hired from BuzzFeed, and I'm like, "What are you doing? You're sitting on millions of people. You should be." I said, "You're waiting for media to show up." You should be streaming every single time, every single event, creating that uh, momentum because, all, again, so you're not hoping somebody shows up. You're actually on top of it. I just think that that's sort of just how the thinking has to be because, again, the electorate in Georgia is going to look totally different six years from now. They got to cultivate that. And so you get about 95,000, you cultivate folks properly, you win by a quarter of a million, 300,000. You're good, because here's the deal. Republicans are not going to run a Herschel Walker again. They're going to run a very strong candidate. And so, look, you're not going to be running against a fool. Mm -hmm. And so you got to be prepared for that. Final comment. Absolutely. And listen, and I, I know that Georgia can do this, right? It took 14 years to get to what we saw last night, right? We have been registering the voters, doing expanding the electorate in tons of ways with new voters. We make sure that everyone that moves into the state's getting registered and finding a movement home. We then talk to them nonstop. But like you're saying, we have to, we have to stay on top of our toes. We have to keep um, building upon and, and really developing the young strategists, the young political strategists to make sure that we get even more sophisticated over the next six years. And so, and we all saw Georgia's going to be, it could potentially be one of the top primary states. So we'll have another opportunity in a couple years to show off and show out again. So I just, I know that we have the infrastructure. We just need the continued investment. People need to keep believing. And we got this. 
uh, Hillary Ali, congratulations, great job. We appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <clears throat> I want to bring in our, our panel, Joe Richardson, the civil rights attorney, Rebecca Carruthers, vice president for Fair Election Center. I'm glad to have both of you here. Rebecca, I want to start with you. Um, and again, I, I am just, uh, again, and uh, it, uh, I'm not one of these people who uh, I, can, I can pause and celebrate, but literally, just how my brain works, I'm already like, okay, what's next? Uh, in terms of the, in terms of how the how the future works, and when I go back and I look at like somebody tweeted last night, uh, and I had to slam them. Actually, it was today. Somebody tweeted, uh, "Oh, if black people had turned out uh, for Mandela Barnes and for Sherry Beasley, we would have 53 United States senators." And I fired back. Well, Mandela Barnes campaign had to pay attention to black people, and not have a 50,000 voter drop off in Milwaukee. He wins. If Beasley's campaign brings in Vice President Kamala Harris, brings in President Barack Obama, actually have an HBCU initiative and actually go after the black voters in the Southern Belt of North Carolina, she wins. And so I just think that when we're talking about the future, we have to be thinking about black power and maximizing our black power I'm not interested in just squeaking by. I want to see us dominate. And I just think that we have to be focused on that in these Senate races, these congressional races, in these statewide races, in these Supreme, state Supreme Court races, these DA races. We literally could run the table in so many places if we move our numbers 5, 10, 15, 20 percent and maximize them. You're right. We have to keep our foot on the gas. Um, when we saw the exit polling from um, the general election in Georgia, we saw that based upon the demographics, that it was black voters, black men and black women who really pushed Warnock across the finish line to even allow for it to be a runoff. And so I'm waiting to see what the exit polling looks like from last night. Um, but when I think about the work that my organization did on the ground, um, we organize um, students and college campuses, whether it's an HBCU, a community college, a public um, PWI. We work with the Georgia Coalition, in which we're a member of. We're a member of America Votes. We participate on the C3 side. But the thing that we do is that we organize year, year in, year out. Our motto is every year, every vote, and we mean that and we fight for it. You can't just show up during an election year. You can't just show up even when there is national funding um, pouring into a state, but you have to have a commitment and be there every single day because you have voters every single day who want to be engaged. And so organizations like mine and other organizations, other grassroots partners, we have to make sure in January we're knocking on, we're, if it's an organization that knocks on doors, phone bank, um, the text messaging, because organize, organizations like mine that does um, digital outreach, but also work with students on campus, making sure that they're doing peer-to-peer -peer outreach, that they're working with their campus administrators, they're working with their student governments, um, especially on HBCUs. But it's that important, and we have to make it that important, and we have to take it seriously. Um, Joe, uh, I mentioned the legal fights. Look, let's be real clear. We're going to need more lawyers. Uh, Republicans are going to try to change the laws again. Um, the Supreme Court um, uh, had the hearing today talking about uh, this weird as, you know, concept, this legal concept that state legislatures can pretty much do whatever they want with the elections. The fact that this thing has gotten all the way to the Supreme Court, look, uh, they've got people on that Supreme Court who believe in that crap. And so we better understand the battle <clears throat> that lies ahead for elections. They, I, I, I keep saying this, and I've been saying this for years, which is why my book is White Fear, How the Browning of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds. Okay? That was today's Supreme Court hearing. This is the train that's coming. The train is coming, and they see it. And they are afraid to death of this train running them over. And so we have, and look, for I don't know how long it's going to be there, but we're going to have a 6-3 conservative Supreme Court. And so we need to understand we have to stay 
in war mode. Let me say this again. People, I know somebody's like, oh, Roller, yeah, that's just, you, you're hyping it. No, we have to literally stay in war mode because they are going to try everything to narrow uh, the voting because they see the train that's coming. No doubt about it. Um, things are changing in this country very quickly. The, the primary issue uh, that the country was built on and about, frankly, was race. And so, therefore, when you're getting ready to be overrun by people that don't look like you, or in your mind, people that don't think like you, even though I think that most people have a lot of things in common, there's been a divide and conquer tactic that has happened since the beginning, since going back to slavery, right? Uh, you know, and so let's keep everybody separate. Let's keep people that have a lot in common not talking to each, each other. And now, because we're getting ready to be outnumbered, let's deal with it from a vote standpoint. You're right about the judicial side. Uh, in terms of the lawyers and the things that need to happen. This, this Supreme Court case is quite scary. Basically, it would, it would basically say that there are no checks and balances. If it comes out the way they want it, there would be no checks and balances on what a state legislature does. And so, therefore, the state legislature in Georgia, for instance, four years from now in, in John Ossoff's election, can say, well, we don't like what DeKalb County is doing. We don't like what uh, you know, Fulton County is doing. And therefore, we will take all of that from them. The counties will have no say, and we'll do it the way we want to. And if we don't like what they send us, we will not certify the votes. You know, there are people that will say, oh, man, it really can't happen that way. No, absolutely. The idea that this is being entertained at all at the Supreme Court and that it is not a foregone conclusion that they won't dismiss it out of hand lets you know where we are. And so to your point, we absolutely do have to squeeze the juice out of the orange and get as many voters going as we can. We were very fortunate yesterday, listen, for all the great work Sister Holly did and all the great work that was done on the ground and all that was done in the last 10 years by Stacey Abrams and her ilk, at the end of the day, we had a terrible, terrible candidate. And that really, really helped. So that some people, even the first time around that voted for Brian Kemp, wouldn't vote for him, Republicans, no less. And they may have held their nose and voted for him the second time, but the Senate wasn't in, uh, wasn't hanging in the balance. And so we were very, very good, but we were a little lucky too. And so because of that, to your point, we do have to plant those seeds now, create a culture of voting where people vote just as uh, commonly as they do every other mandatory life function. It's not, we'll do X or Y or Z, and if we feel good, if we're motivated, if, if, it, if, if what he's saying tinkles our, twinkles our toes, then we'll go vote. No, we have to vote like our life and our existence depends on it as it pertains to the Supreme Court because we didn't go vote, because we're sexist, because et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We've got a 6-3 court that does not do and will not do the will of the people or will not acknowledge the will of the people or maybe even the legislatures or local governments for decades to come. And so we cannot minimize this to their point. Uh, Dr. Larry Walker, assistant professor, University of Central Florida. Uh, Larry, um, again, uh, I think you, you enjoy victory. You take a breath. The organizers and everybody, they, they get some sleep. Um, folks like us get some sleep. You get some rest. Uh, but again, they're coming back. The GOP is pissed. I mean, Laura Ingram, boy, last night, she was just foaming at the mouth on Fox News, angry that they lost again. And uh, this is going to continue. And we need to be prepared, be prepared for the vicious assault uh, on voting. Remember, they changed the law in 2020 in Texas, and Trump won. So these people, uh, they know what's coming. And, and I just really think uh, we got to be ready. In fact, uh, I was really cracking up last night. I'm going to play this here and want you to respond uh, just to see, because Fox News is about to go ham on black people and young voters because that fool Herschel uh, lost. Listen to Laura Ingram, who was raised by a Nazi sympathizer, whine and shed these red MAGA tears. Guys, uh, uh, we appreciate it. Bill, uh, stay with us. All right, um, we have more. All right, we're not going to more. We got to go to Molly Hemingway. Sorry, I have a whole script in front of me. Molly Hemingway and, of course, uh, Kellyanne Conway. Molly, you and I talked about this about a week ago. We felt this coming. To me, it never felt 
like the Senate Republicans wanted this guy in office. He was a Trump pick. They didn't like that. They probably like him as a person, Herschel as a person. But there wasn't the intensity on the part of the Republicans as there was on the part of the Democrats. I felt it. You felt it. But we don't change anything. We have the same people in place in leadership, same people in place apparently at the RNC. That's not perhaps that's not changing. We just keep doing the same thing over and over again. I I'm pissed tonight, frankly. Go ahead. Yeah, it's really offensive. I'm for, mad. For Republican voters, for Republican donors who have put so much into having some wins, and they just see kind of failure across the board. There aren't people who are working on early voting or banking ballots. There's no clear messaging. I mean, you look at what happened since the midterm elections, where you had a Senate that basically responded to those disappointing midterm losses by doing nothing other than sabotaging their own base. What is the case for voting Republican for the Senate after these midterms? I don't think one was even attempted to be made. And yeah, nothing seems to be changing. But you didn't see a lot of enthusiasm down there. Of course, the spending was completely— Three to I mean, one. It was, yeah, it was just— Look at how close it was, though. I mean, I'm, in the end, we, what did we say? This was winnable. Kellyanne, I know you don't want any winnable. change. You, you want Ron McDaniel. I like Ron McDaniel. Isn't this like a, a warning sign flashing? Or are we just going to keep doing the same thing all over again every single election? Well, Kevin all, McCarthy all, won the House. He won the all, House. Yes, he did. And we were outspent three to one here. Why? There's no excuse. There's no excuse in Georgia for us not to have done what Brian Kemp did. Yes, he's the incumbent governor. He's very popular. He's running against Stacey Abrams. But he turned out over his micro-targeting plan, his grassroots people, and I guess uh, Mitch McConnell's group funded it. But they did that in the last couple of days. He it should have been done four what, weeks what, ago. Did Mitch McConnell Laura, appear down there? The whining. Larry, they're so upset. Trust me. When she said, I'm pissed, their fangs are going to come out. Speaking of fangs, maybe Herschel Walker shouldn't have been talking about vampires and werewolves and talk about the importance <laughs> of maintaining <laughs> Medicare and Social Security. <laughs> <laughs> look, look, Roland, listen, let, let's be clear. You know, you know, I worked on a number of campaigns. And he was a bad candidate, but he was handpicked by Trump, their guy, Fox News' guy. Well, I don't know if he's his guy, their guy anymore. They seem to be making a turn, but he just wasn't a good candidate. He couldn't articulate policy issues. He couldn't articulate anything. He was a terrible candidate. And like I said, I worked on a number of campaigns, but this is he's one of the worst candidates that I, I've seen in, in recent memory. And that's saying a lot, considering some of the Republican candidates we've seen over the last few years. But the bottom line is, if you're not talking about important issues that are, you know, we talk about, you know, families that sit at, at, at the dinner table, have conversations, obviously we're talking about issues relating to inflation, in which they talk about a lot, but then in support the um, Inflation Reduction Act. There are a lot of issues out there that Americans care about that Herschel Walker and the Republican Party aren't talking about. Rolling, we've talked about on your show in terms of how they lost, in, you know, the election, recent election, they lost uh, uh, young folks to 18 to 29. That's because they, they, they're fighting against student loan debt and all these other um, women's reproductive rights, all these other issues that that demographic and people from racially ethnic backgrounds care about. But the Republicans ignore that. What they do is they pass more restrictive laws to make it difficult for more black folks to vote. We saw the long lines in, in Georgia again. Now, what we should do is we should be at a federal level focusing on how to address those kinds of issues and making sure Americans have money in their pocket, child tax credit, et cetera. But they don't want to talk about those issues. They want to talk about critical race theory, um, you know, like I said, vampires and werewolves and all kinds of other, you know, characters we see on television. But that's not what Americans want to hear about. They want to hear about important topics and how, what's, what are the issues you focus on or highlight that will impact, have a positive impact on my life. Uh, indeed. All right, folks. Um, uh, the memes have been flying all around. This is probably one of the funniest ones I've seen today. Uh, right here. The Georgia werewolf hunter. Yes. A one-way ticket back to Texas. All right. Got to go to a break. We come back. Supreme Court today, folks, had oral arguments of a critical case that could determine, again, elections in the future. Republicans want to steal as many as possible, and they've got the vote to the Supreme Court to actually do it. Where do we, you hear some of the craziness that was discussed today in the Supreme Court? My goodness, 
Folks, don't forget to download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. You can also uh, support us by joining our Bring the Funk fan club. So many of you gave last night. I certainly appreciate it. Uh, check the money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash App, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com, rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. And get your copy of my book, Why Fear How the Brownie of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds. That's what this election stuff is all about, folks. Uh, you want to read what's going on. Trust me, I break it all down. Buy it uh, at your bookstores, online, download it from Audible, or order for your favorite black bookstore. I'll be right back. Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr, we welcome the Black Star Network's very own Roland Martin, who joins us to talk about his new book, White Fear, how the browning of America is making white folks lose their minds. The book explains so much about what we're going through in this country right now and how, as white people head toward becoming a racial minority, it's going to get, well, let's just say even more interesting. We are going to see more violence. We're going to see more vitriol because as each day passes, it's, it, it is a nail in that coffin. The one and only Roland Martin on the next Black Table, right here on the Black Star Network. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, inflation is on the rise. Interest rates are high. Can you still thrive during these uncertain times? On the next Get Wealthy, you're gonna meet a woman who's done just that, living proof of what you need to do to flourish during these uncertain times. These are times where you take advantage of what's going on. This is how people get rich or richer. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. Hi, I'm B.B. Winans. Hi, I'm Kim Burrell. Hi, I'm Carl Payne. Hey, everybody, this is Sherry Shepard. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered, and while he's doing Unfiltered, I'm practicing the wobble. For folks, the United States Supreme Court could shift election authority in North Carolina and states all across the country. Today, they heard arguments on whether state legislature, legislators can set federal voting rules without any oversight from state courts. If the majority Republican court agrees with North Carolina's Republican leaders, it will fundamentally change how elections are being conducted. This would give state lawmakers exclusive authority to structure federal elections only subject to intervention by Congress. North Carolina Republicans want the Supreme Court to restore a, a redistricting map drawn by the GOP-led legislature that was rejected by the state Supreme Court because it violated the state constitution. The court's conservative justices, Clarence Thomas, Sam Alito, and Neil Gorsuch, are very receptive to siding with North Carolina legislators. The case could significantly influence the results of every election moving forward. Joining me now is Tamia D. Booker, founder and managing director of T. Booker Strategies. To me, I'm glad to have you on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Thank you for having me. For folks who don't understand this weird as hell legal, I don't know what to even call it, this <laughs> legal theory, it is, it is so far-fetched. But what the Republicans did was they crafted these, they crafted the lawsuits to directly oh. appeal to these Federalist Society Supreme Court justices who would love to do this, and this could impact every election, local, state, and national. That's correct. And so I just worked on a campaign in North Carolina, and the gentleman referred to this earlier. This is due to the hyperpartisan nature of the Supreme Court, right? Like, we have seen a very right-leaning Supreme Court that is willing to listen to this case where other Supreme Courts would have never even heard this out. 
And this will change, as you said, this will change elections because many voters of color will be silenced with these changes of, of laws. And it's important to note, as you said, before the Republicans were trying to have congressional representation in North Carolina to be 11 and 3. And with the amount of black voters in North Carolina alone, how can you <coughs> only three members of Congress could possibly represent the amount of black Americans in that state? Currently, it's 7-7. Seven, seven, and that is with the intervention, as you mentioned, of the Supreme Court. There is no way that this is fair. And we must ensure that this does not happen. And so, unfortunately, right now, we are at a, a crossroads where we really need to pass the voting. We need to pass the H.R. 4, the John Lewis uh, Restoration Act, and we need to reauthorize the Voting Rights Act. People hear about this all the time, but this is exactly why this has to happen, because this has consequence. This has serious consequences that will be that will impact us across the country. And see, I, I think what people need to understand, <clears throat> what, what, what they're angry about, they're angry in North Carolina, the Democrats, in fact, before the election, had a four to three to majority on the, on the Supreme Court. They're angry that even though you, you had an anti-gerrymandering Republican Supreme Court justice in Ohio, she's now retired, but she got replaced by somebody who supports it. They're angry that the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. So they're angry that even when they have Republicans on the Supreme Court, these Republicans are following the law. Correct. And these Republic, these state Supreme Courts are not letting them run rampant. Now, mm -hmm. what, what I'm trying to understand is why is this even going to the U.S. Supreme Court? How is the U.S. Supreme Court acting as if they can tell state Supreme Courts what they can do. They are literally trying to still legislate from the bench, right? They are still acting in this partisan way, and they're trying to actually have political influence from the bench. We saw it this year with women's rights. It is still happening. And when I worked in the Senate, we saw this with Supreme Court nominations. This is why Democrats were so adamantly against our last couple of nominations, because they are literally trying to make changes from the Supreme Court. And that is not what a Supreme Court is supposed to do. And it is so unfortunate that this court is so unbalanced. It's so unfair. And what they will do is they will literally change our lives as Americans, as Black people, as people of color. And it is unfair and it is unjust. And that is exactly what is happening right now. This would never, as you said, this would never have come before the courts before. This would not have come before. And what Trump, the, his administration did, and with, with Mitch McConnell and that Senate did to try to pass through these nominees, they knew what they were doing. As you mentioned, they were angry. I had candidates in Ohio, and I'm from the state of Pennsylvania. And listening to my former colleagues and, and current uh, clients there talking to me about how those changes were made with Republicans because it was completely unfair, they would never be okay with it with Democratic majorities, which we do now have in Pennsylvania. So it is a mockery of what's happening in this country, and it is going to be de detrimental. It's it's unbearable. I, I can't believe we're going through this. And, and, and so, again, before I go to uh, my panel here, what their real aim is, anything dealing with the elections, they can completely ignore all state courts. And so they want to put all of the authority in the hand of the legislat legislators. Now, for the people who haven't really read American history, mm -hmm. who don't understand American history, and we really learned this for the first time in Bush v. Gore, mm -hmm. when Justice Scalia and this whole originalist, th th this concept, when he said then that there was no affirmative right to vote in the U.S. Constitution. And so, what people have to understand, when this country was set up, it was set up for landowners, mm -hmm. male landowners, white male landowners. The rich people in America did not want the poor people having any say. And so, before we elected U.S. senators, the legislatures chose the U.S. senators. And so what these, so what they want to do is they want to go back to where the legislature controls everything. They can yes. throw out electors. And, and, and the reason they want it to go to Congress, because, and again, explain to the people when you read the Constitution, what happens 
with the House and the Senate. So if they control the House, then they determine. So walk people through that so they understand really how these things are all connected to how these white slave owners wrote the Constitution to have white folks to be completely in control of who is in power. Correct. So gerrymandering happens at all levels, and that is basically when you take, a, when the people in power dictate who stays in power, just like you said. So that can happen starting at the state level. So if you have a, a legislature run by Republicans, then you can determine, you draw the you draw the electoral map and determine how many congressional uh, seats there are, and you you draw that based on population. So if people saw a couple months back in Alabama. They noted that there's only one seat drawn for Democrats. And when you look at the way the state is, it's not quite right, right? And so that's how you, they, and they ruled that that was okay, but it shouldn't be okay. And so when you do that, you keep the power limited in the state. So the state stays in, the state Republicans stay in power. And then Congress always maintains a Republican majority in that state. Then you take that to the next level, right? So then you have the Senate. And we had a, a Democratic senator there at one point, and that was because of Black people. However, when you are doing this type of work, you have money that goes into the state, and you have laws that are impacted, and impacted, and many of that is also, which I did not mention earlier, voter suppression that impacts our people. Hope, I know I talk fast, so hopefully everybody is staying with me. So... You're talking a lot slower than I am. Don't worry about it. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, okay, good. And so, therefore, when you have a Republican-led state house, a Republican-led state senate, a Republican governor, a Republican-led congressional delegation, and then Republican-led senators, but you have a state that has a significant black population or a significant uh, population of voters of color, when do they listen to you? When do they have pass laws that impact you? When does that happen? And this is when red states get redder. And we have, like you said earlier about Georgia, there's a lot of, there's going to be a, a very different situation in Georgia now, right? This is the first time I think we've seen it where we have Republican leadership and two Democratic senators. That is not normal. So all of this is by design, right? Where you have the, the same people make the same decisions about everything else, the same people who are majority white. They, there was an attempt, you know, yesterday that did not happen but they're majority white, and they're going to keep making decisions that benefit and are for white, a certain white person. That's not the way the country's going. But so, 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 but also, but explain, though, and again, panelists, I'm coming to you after this question right here. Explain, though, how the Constitution is set up where the House decides electors, because that's really what they're aimed. See, all of this is also tied to Donald Trump losing. And so, right. so th there's a provision in the Constitution. If there's a contested election, the House decides electors. And right. they can yeah. accept the electors from the state legislature, not how the people voted. Right. January 6th, right? This is why January 6th was what it was, is because the plan was to make sure that the House voted a certain way. And if you have, the House has to ratify the election per the Constitution on January 6th of that following year after an election. So January 6th of 2021 happened. And as you saw, many electeds, and there was a, there were a few senators that were caught up in a, in a, in a situation who were not trying to uh, reauthorize and, and uh, excuse me, authorize that Joe Biden was the president of the United States. So, so hold up, hold up, hold up. Somebody at home, they missed all that. The, <laughs> okay. the Senate does not, the House certifies the, the, the election. The House certified, and that is exactly why they were heading over. That's why they went to the House of Representatives, and that's why Speaker Pelosi at the time and many of the other leaders were in jeopardy because they were over there to vote and, and vote in the president of the United States. So if you are trying to manipulate how many members are represented from your state, then that will impact how you vote after a presidential election. And that also will impact how you can elect Supreme Court justices, or excuse yep. me, Supreme Court justices later on. So all of it is connected. So these Republicans, 
if the state Supreme Court says what you're doing is illegal, they want to be able to have the Supreme Court say, we don't have to listen to y'all. We can do whatever the hell we want in any election. Because the people voted for us. But did they? Great point. Um, Rebecca, you first. So my organization was at the Supreme Court today because we filed the amicus brief um, in, on behalf of every single chapter of the League of Women Voters. And so can you talk more about what the implications look like if you have an election and there's different rules for the federal part of that election or the federal part of that ballot versus state and local part of that ballot? What does that look like if a state, if a state legislature decides that, hey, you could do absentee voting on the state and local, but you have to do in-person voting on the federal portion of that ballot? Can you talk through the chaos that would happen at the local level? Yes, that's horrible. Um, you have you would just you would cause a lot of confusion because people a lot of times we are at a place now where, as we've seen in the last couple of midterms, that our our country is voting in record numbers. And there already was a little bit of confusion during 2020 when we were in um, when we were in a pandemic and more people were voting absentee. But if you are now saying for these elections where there's state elections during a presidential year, so you have to vote twice, that's unfair. And for and 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 inconvenient, and for, particularly for voters of color, right, who don't have time to, who don't work from home and don't have time to take off and have responsibilities, they may only have one time to vote or are voting absentee, and it can be confusing. And so that again is another tactic to suppress the vote, and that should not happen. To hear, Larry, you're next. Yeah, so you, you mentioned a few things. You talked about the federal society, which for years has is, is, is been a pipeline, which Republicans always talk about activist judges, but essentially that's what we have right now in terms of the Supreme Court and some federal judges confirmed during the, the, the Trump administration. Can you talk about, and, and I know on Rolling Show we've talked about this a lot in terms of democracy, could you talk about if this happens, and I feel like the game, I feel like the book, the, everything is, is everything's been rigged, right? We already kind of have an idea about how this is going to go. Can you talk about the long-term impact what, what this will have on, the, on this country's democracy? And then, I, even as I'm thinking about the international impact it will have in terms of if if the Supreme Court rules in the direction that they're likely to, what is the long-term impact on our democracy as as a nation? It's it's a lot of things, right? It's the vote, voter suppression is a huge piece, right? Like we talked about reauthorizing the Voting Rights Act. We talked about many laws that we need to protect our, our uh, to protect Americans. Um, even when you astronaut, we talked about authorizing certain wars that need to, that would happen, right? Like tr President Trump was catastrophic for this country, but there was a point where we had some balance where he couldn't do everything that he wanted to do, right? But if there's a, if we get to a point where we have a completely unbalanced, unchecked government, the wrong person could get in office again as our leader, and in many states, and that is that's that's terrifying. And who's protecting, right? And so we have to make sure that we have checks and balances our system, and that is that was designed for a reason. And we have to make sure uh, the parties that are in power are also balanced as well. And so that could have cat catastrophic ramifications for us. And as we saw just this year, right, with the abortion laws, that being led to up to the states, we saw in many states, fortunately for many of the states in this past election, that we were actually able to see rights for women upheld. But that wasn't the case everywhere. But what if it was, right, if certain, if we weren't able to have those ballot initiatives? So it's very important that this does not happen. And this is exactly why prior courts wouldn't hear this, because it just it gives these state legislatures too much power, which state legislatures are also... Yeah, they act as they, they can do whatever they want to. Joe? Yeah, so uh, a, a comment and then a question. I appreciate the work that you're doing. First of all, this would give states, state legislatures, the entire purview. And I keep going back to this whole thing, and I feel sound terrible. I don't feel terrible, but I sound terrible to some people when I say, this is not the framers' country. This is the framers' descendants' country. 
Right. And we can't say what were these what were these white men thinking in the 1700s, whatever else, when they were getting away from Britain and they wanted to do what they wanted to do, and then let's figure it out. So we've got the state legislatures with full purview, except they're subject to Congress, which on the House side is going to be gerrymandered. One of the things that was good about last night is that you can't gerrymander the whole state, even though you try to keep people from voting. And then ultimately the House has is the one that does the elect. They have the electors. They confirm the electors. They certify the election. So you've got them getting, they get them coming in and they get them coming out. You know, if it's Congress, it's us because we're the electors, because we gerrymander. If it's a state legislature, it's us because we're the state legislature. Given the seriousness of all this, I mean, because this is crazy. First of all, have you found that people aren't as aware about this as they should be? And if that's the case, how do we do it? I mean, because they're really not talking about this enough everywhere. This is another direct threat to what we call democracy. Yep. Give us your comments on that. So um, you are so right. I say it all the time. This was not this constitution was not written for us in mind, right? It was not, it was just like Roland said earlier. None of this was where we thought where they thought we would be. Um, and to your point about Congress and electors, last week I was with one of my clients who's a member elect. And we're both young black women. And it was a new day when people mistook us for both of us for members. What district do you represent? Me too. I'm used to being asked if I'm an assistant when I worked on the Hill, right? So that new day that is coming, this young freshman class of diverse young people of color, exactly why all of this is happening, right? Because they are going to be the electors. And so this is this is why people are terrified. This is the this is the shift that's happening. The shift that's happening is that more diverse people are being elected to the House of Representatives. More, and, and one day, hopefully, because I work for one of the only Black Democratic senators, we will have more of us represented in, in the Senate. And so that that is part of why this is happening. Um, and so because it wasn't designed for us, this, this is the shift that's happening. So I think to your question about how do we let more people know? Do people know? No. I know people in North Carolina knew about it because it's affecting them. I know people in Ohio knew about it because they're also up for, re uh, they have to continue with the redistricting. We have to talk about this more. We have to raise awareness and we have to, social media, Roland, all of you, we have to utilize those channels so people are aware that this could possibly be happening because this has, as we said, has severe ramifications and we have to stay aware. And I think that Social media has helped us so much in engaging people in voting. I've been working on campaigns for almost 20 years now, and there has been a huge shift, and social media has helped with that, and we need to raise awareness on critical issues because, like this one, because if you if you don't see it, you, yes, we are winning, and there are, and there are people who are very angry that we're winning, and there is a lot that is, there are a lot of attempts uh, to change that. So we definitely need to continue to do that. I think social media is one of the best ways that we can do so. Yeah, well, I mean, but this is this is precisely why we're focusing on it. Uh, and the bottom line is, uh, you know, we got people spend a lot of time on housewives, this and other kind of stuff like that. Uh, look, like like literally, they're playing. They want to rig and steal elections. That they, they want to the so-called party of law and order wants to ignore the law because they don't like the fact that state Supreme Courts are actually following the law. Right. That's literally what this is all about. Uh, Tamia, we certainly appreciate it. Thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, all right, folks. Uh, I, I keep telling you all why this show matters, why this network matters. Uh, we don't spend time on a bunch of other little silly stuff because, you know what, that stuff, it don't matter. This is the kind of stuff that does matter. Uh, and so, Supreme Court, again, hearing this case uh, and actually, um, you know, going before the case. And so, we need, we need to be fully aware of what's happening and paying attention, folks, uh, at all times. <coughs> all right, my man, uh, Chris Paul, Huggy Low Down, sent me a video uh, last night uh, tied to the election of Herschel Walker. Uh, and I said, you know what, I'm gonna go ahead and show it. Um, this is quite funny, y'all. Uh, check out Chris Paul and Huggy Low Down. Watch. On the first day of Christmas, Herschel made a C. His IQ is negative three. On the second day of Christmas, Herschel made a C. Two abortions 
and his IQ is negative three. On the third day of Christmas, Herschel Walker made a C. Three death threats, two abortions, and his IQ is negative three. On the fourth day of Christmas, Herschel made a C. Four kids ignored, three death threats, two abortions, and his IQ is negative three. On the fifth day of Christmas, Herschel made a C. Five O oh, impersonating. Four kids ignored, three death threats, two abortions, and his IQ is negative three. On the sixth day of Christmas, Herschel made a C. Six years in high school, five O oh, impersonating. Kids ignored three death threats, two abortions, and his IQ is negative three. On the seventh day of Christmas, Herschel made a C. Seven days of shuck and six years in high school, five oh impersonating. Four kids ignored three death threats, two abortions, and his IQ is negative three. On the eighth day of Christmas, Herschel made a C. Eight, no concussion, seven days of shucking, six years in high school, five oh impersonating. Four kids ignored, three death threats, two abortions, and his IQ is negative three. On the ninth day of Christmas, Herschel made a C. Nine pants on fire, eight no concussion, seven days of shucking, six years in high school, five oh impersonating. Four kids ignored, three death threats, two abortions, and his IQ is negative three. On the tenth day of Christmas, Herschel made a C. Ten foot ten, he's lying, nine pants on fire, eight no concussion, seven days of shucking, six years in high school, five oh impersonating. Four kids ignored, three death threats, two abortions, and his IQ is negative three. On the eleventh day of Christmas, Herschel made a C. Eleven dollar haircut, ten for ten, he's lying, nine pants on fire, eight no concussion, seven days of shucking, six years in high school, five oh impersonating. Four kids ignored, three death threats, two abortions, and his IQ is negative three. On the twelfth day of Christmas, Herschel made a C. Twelve months on Trump's nuts, eleven dollar haircut, ten for ten, he's lying, nine pants on fire, eight no concussions, seven days of shucking, six years in high school, five oh impersonating. Four kids ignored, three death threats, two abortions, and his IQ is negative. I got some fool on our YouTube channel talking about, I don't understand this. Are we just mean people? Dude, take a damn joke. Uh, Rebecca, I saw your eyes get wide when you first played the video. You were like, I cannot believe he is playing this. It wasn't that. I was just trying to figure out what each of the things were going to be. And I was just like, oh, no, oh, no. That was probably not the hyperventilate. I didn't want to do that live on air. But, yeah. Can you send me the video? Because I got a lot of people to pass it um, Yes, I will <laughs> send you the video. So, And I will play it again at the end of the show. Let me thank Chris Paul and Huggy Lowdown, J. Anthony Brown, for sending that to me as well. All right, y'all, got to go to a break. We come back and update on the Taylor Jefferson case. Also, uh, a fan base is moving towards uh, closing out their round of investment. This is the last time you've been able to invest in this black-owned social media platform. Isaac Hayes III, the founder of Fanbase, will be joining us on the show. 
All right, folks, uh, don't forget, download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Also, uh, support our Breed of Funk fan club. Uh, that is uh, P.O. Box 5, checks and money orders, go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash App, Dallas Side, RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R. Martin Unfiltered. Zell is, excuse me, Venmo is RM Unfiltered. And Zell is rolling at rollinsmartin.com, rolling at rollinmartinunfiltered.com. And get your copy of my book, White Fear, how the browning of America is making white folks lose their minds. Available on all platforms, uh, bookstores, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target. Also, download the copy on Audible. Uh, and we'll be right back. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we've seen shock. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. I am on screen and I am representing what a black man is to the entire world that's gonna see this. And this might be the only black man, a representation of a black man that they see. Right. So I am responsible, right, for how they see black men. And it's my responsibility to, if I am not playing an upstanding, honorable, of someone with a strong principle and moral core, to make sure that this character is so specific. Right that it is him, not black men. And I wish that more actors would realize how important uh, their position is as an actor, as an actor of color, playing people of color on screen. Because there are people that see us all over the world in, in, in these different right. images that we portray. And not everyone knows black people to know, yes, that's not all. on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. Soil, you will not white people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we've seen shock. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Hey, I'm Arnaz J. Black TV does matter, dang it. Hey, what's up, y'all? It's your boy, Jacob Lattimore, and you're now watching Roland Martin right now. Stay woke.
Folks, a family of 34-year-old, 34-year-old uh, Mark Brown Jr. is still searching for him. His family has not heard from him since um, uh, February 27th. Mark is six feet tall, weighs 175 pounds, black hair and brown eyes. Any more information about Mark Brown Jr. You should call the Chicago Special Victims Unit at 312-747-8380. 312-747-8380. In Texas, testimony in the Aaron Dean murder trial continued today. Dean is the former Fort Worth police officer who shot and killed Atiana Jefferson through a window of her home. Today, Jefferson's sister, Ashley Carr, took the stand and told the jury why Atiana was taking care of her nephew, explaining her sister's goals and why she moved back home. A Tatiana graduated from Xavier University, I think in like 2014. Right after college, where did she go? She move in immediately into Yolanda or go somewhere else? After college, Tay came home. She moved in with my mom and she stayed there for maybe like a year or so. And then she moved out to, uh, you know, wanting to have her own wings. Um, but then when we start, we start getting, our mother start becoming ill, she decided that it would be best for her to move home to help my mother because it was a long drive from Dallas to Fort Worth of her coming out here to help, as well as for her to start saving so that she can go to medical school. She wanted to find the cure of diabetes because she's had it since she was very young. So she lives in the home, you said in 2015 or so? April, April of 2019. 2019, because she uh -huh. moved in. She moved, yeah, she moved in, moved out, moved back in. So April of 2019 is when she had moved in, before this happened. Mm -hmm. When she moved into that house, are you familiar with that particular neighborhood? More familiar now. Okay. Throughout the course of this trial? Yes. All right. During the time when this happened in October, were you living outside of Fort Worth, or where were you living? I live in Houston. You still live there? Yes. All right. Okay. So inside of that house in October of 2019, who all lived there? Um, Tatiana, um, Zion, and my mother, Yolanda. How long had Yolanda and your mother been in the hospital before this happened? Um, about a couple weeks, because uh, Amber was in the hospital as well. Amber's in the hospital, your mom's in the hospital, and so who is taking care of Zion those few weeks that that's happened? So Atatiana is taking care of Zion. Is she working for that time? Yeah, she's, she works at home. She works from home. All right. And so you heard, did you hear Zion testify? Yes. Um, and were you familiar, if not, that's okay, were you familiar about the use of the front door and the side door in that house with the family? Yes. Okay. Tell me about that. Tell the jury about that. My mom's side door is always open. It was one of those, you just pull up and come on in type house. Would she leave the door unlocked? Yes. Would she keep that front door shut? Yes. Mayor, first word shot? Yes, ma'am. I'm going to hand you what's been pre-marked as States Exhibit 90, 91, and 92. Do you recognize those photographs? Yes. Okay. Can you tell me States Exhibit 90? Who was that? A Tatiana. And States Exhibit 91. Who is that? A Tatiana and Zion. And who is this little boy over here? Um, this is our cousin slash um, nephew. Well, that's my nephew. I don't even know. Wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. I think we have the wrong photograph. I thought that was. <laughs> Zion. This is Zion. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Okay, proceed. Yes, you. go ahead. Um, and then, I'm sorry, I didn't want to cut you, cut you off. Um, you said Zion, Tatiana, and then who is the other boy to the left? Our little cousin, Daily Young. And then 92, what is that? A Tatiana at a graduation. Okay. Is that graduated from, from high school or from college? College. Do these all fairly and accurately depict the Tatiana and the way that she looked as an adult, close in time to when this happened? Yes. And tell me, State's Exhibit 90, do you know where that was taken? Yes. Where? Um, in San Diego. We had um, went, did our first siblings trip 
to San Diego to see our brother because that's where he's currently stationed in the Navy. Okay. Got we offer states exhibit 90, 91, and 92. And this, these have been previously shown to the best council and provided. Okay. Uh, states 90, 91, 92 are admitted. <clears throat> yes, Mr. Hicks. Summer of 2018. Now looking at states exhibit 91, who are we looking at here? Zion and um, Zion and Tatiana. And what are the labs? Is that this day Leon? And now states exhibit 92. That's uh, a Tatiana at her graduation from Xavier University. If you will unclip that microphone for me. Tuesday, Aaron Dean's partner, Officer Carol Dark, testified that she never saw Jefferson's gun on the scene and never heard Dean say he saw a weapon. Monday, jurors heard from Jefferson's 11-year-old nephew, Zion Carr, who was with her the night Dean killed her. Uh, he explained, of course, that the door was open because they had burnt their hamburgers. Dean is facing up to 99 years in prison if he is convicted. Folks, a Michigan family is filing a wrongful death lawsuit against the city of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, Patrick Lioa's family filed a wrongful death lawsuit against former officer Christopher Schur and the city of Grand Rapids. Schur Stop. shot uh, Lioa in the back of the head in April after pulling him over because his license plate didn't match his car. The suit alleges that Sure used excessive force during his encounter and that the current Grand Rapids police policies and procedures contributed to Lioa's death. The lawsuit does not specify the amount of money the plaintiff seek and asks that a jury determine damages. Sure was charged with second-degree murder. A status hearing is scheduled for December 15th. A black Michigan cop wins a racial bias lawsuit against the city of Detroit. Detroit police officer Johnny Strickland was awarded $150,000 for a 2017 incident where Mr. Strickland, who was off duty, inadvertently entered a crime scene before police secured it. He identified himself as a Detroit police officer, but officers on the scene ridiculed him and placed him in handcuffs. Internal studies conducted by the Detroit Police Department reveal racial tensions within the officers' ranks and racial misconduct by officers directed at community members. The ACLU filed a lawsuit on Strickland's behalf in 2018. Folks, in Hawaii, former correctional officers are being sentenced to eight years in federal prison for assault and conspiracy. Jason Tagola, a corrections officer in the Community Correctional Center, beat inmate Chon uh, Kelly 45 times over two minutes in 2015. Tagola and three other correctional officers, Craig Pickney, Jonathan Tom, and Jordan DeMantos, were transporting Kelly across the facility, breaking his jaw, orbital socket, and nose. Tagola participated in a cover-up conspiracy, including writing false reports, submitting false statements, and providing false testimony. All four officers have been fired and they've also been convicted. The FBI is investigating a link between the Colorado Club Q shooter and a racist website. Anderson Lee Aldrich created two free speech sites titled Wrong Targets, which advocates killing civilians to cleanse society. 
Ulrich uh, uploaded videos of himself to the site minutes before the mass killing. The wrong target, uh, uh, brother, the wrong target's uh, brother site also hosted a graphic video of the Buffalo mass shooting that killed 10 black people. Aldrich is facing 305 criminal counts, including first degree murder and bias motivated crimes for the November 19th mass shooting that killed five people and injured 17 others. All right, folks, gotta go to a break. We come back. We're gonna talk about uh, fan base, but also how these large companies, Facebook and others, are deliberately suppressing your content. We'll talk with Isaac Hayes III the founder of Fanbase Next on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, inflation is on the rise. Interest rates are high. Can you still thrive during these uncertain times? On the next Get Wealthy, you're going to meet a woman who's done just that, living proof of what you need to do to flourish during these uncertain times. These are times where you take advantage of what's going on. This is how people get rich or richer. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Hey, I'm Antonique Smith. Hello, everyone. It's Kiara Sheard. Hey, I'm Taj. I'm Coco. And I'm Lily. And we're at SWV. What's up, y'all? It's Ryan Destiny, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. <laughs> That these tech companies really have a lot of us fooled. People actually think that, oh, I've got hundreds of thousands or millions of followers, but mm, actually you don't. They're not actually allowing you to reach all your followers. Last night was a perfect example. So uh, we were broadcasting last night from the Marriott Marquis. We're uh, uh, from the victory party of Senator Raphael Warnock. Now, we were live streaming on all different platforms, Black Star Network, YouTube, Facebook, um, Instagram, Twitch, all the different places. So we were on YouTube, where we have about 960,000 subscribers, okay? We had about 10,000 folks watching live. 10,000 folks watching live at that very time. Now, on Facebook, I have 1.3 million followers. This is how many people were watching at its height. 627. Now, there's no way in the world, there's no way in the world, folks, we're sitting here with 1.3 million followers and so many people engage in this story and only 627 people watching on Facebook. We have been monitoring this uh, for quite some time. I have sent emails to Facebook, and I've had two different people tell me there's a glitch in our system. So then when I follow up saying, I'm sorry, has the glitch been fixed? Because my followers, people who are actually on Facebook, have hit me and said they 
have not been receiving their notifications when we go live. Straight up, they've been saying that. And so you need to understand what uh, these companies are doing. In fact, uh, when I posted this uh, last night, uh, let me see if I can find it. When I posted this last night uh, on uh, my Instagram page, uh, there are people who commented and said, oh my goodness, you're absolutely right. They said, I haven't been getting uh, my notifications uh, at all. Uh, and so let's see here. Uh, like, so, so you see here, uh, people actually commenting right here where they watch. Some people say they watched on Roku, they watch other places. And again, this is what they are doing, where people are not getting notified. Isaac Hayes III is the CEO of Fanbase, the founder. He talked about this all the time, how these social media companies are really trying to suck up all the money themselves and not flow it to content providers. And Isaac, glad to have you back. And this is a perfect example. There's no way in hell you can tell me I got 10,000 on YouTube, but 627 on Facebook, and it's not being suppressed. Yeah. Content suppression is uh, a standard in social media. Um, it, it's, it's how these platforms make billions and billions of dollars in revenue. In fact, I need to find a, a statement today that actually one of my... Um, one of my colleagues sent me, it was a, 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 a note about how TikTok is about to make $10 billion in ad revenue off of free content, content provided by the users, that they're running ads in between. And so what happens is these platforms realize that, Roland, if you can reach 1.5 million people every time you broadcast or go live, right. companies can come to you and pay you directly and not run ads on their platform. So they smush everybody's content down to about three to five percent of their following. So then you are not a viable option for most people to advertise to because your metrics don't look like you have a broad reach when you actually do. They're just suppressing your content. And see, what people have to understand, so here's a perfect example. When you start talking about ratings, okay? Uh, so uh, this is from Mediaite. So just so you understand, uh, these were the total viewers. Okay, so this is yesterday. Fox and Friends morning show, 963,000 total viewers. CNN's morning show, 300,000 total viewers. Morning Joe, 890,000 total viewers. Newsmax, News Nation, 15,000, 14,000. Okay, so let's go on down here to, let's see, so you see right here, folks, you're seeing, so Fox, largest network, outnumbered 1.5 million, America Reports, 1.4 million, then you get to Neil Cavuto, 1.7 million, The Five, 3.5 million, Brett, Brett Baer, 2.7 million, Jesse Waters, 3 million, Tucker Carlson, 3.2 million, Sean Hannity, 3.2 million, Laura Ingram, 2.8 million, Greg Gutfeld, 2 million. Okay, so what Isaac is saying is that if they're not suppressing numbers, let's say on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, I actually, if I'm streaming to Twitter, to Facebook, and Instagram simultaneously, I would actually, with my numbers, I would be reaching more people than a number of the top-rated shows on Fox News. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's currency. Um, and I can go out and go to advertisers and sell that. Absolutely. I mean, social media's entire business is built on advertising. Um, and it's, it's actually a dying business. A lot of platforms are going to lose billions of dollars in revenue because um, consumers are being uh, told their options about being tracked, you know, inside their phone, outside their phone. Um, and they're opting out of a lot of these, these platforms being able to track them when they're not using the app. A lot of these apps can track you when you're not using the app. And they're still getting data on you, places you go, places you frequent, what stores you shop in, um, all the things that they can sell to companies to target you based off geolocated ads. So if you're driving and you stop at Chick-fil-A, uh, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok can know that you stopped at Chick-fil-A, so therefore they can sell an ad to Chick-fil-A to target you later on just by you driving close to Chick-fil-A. 
it's really, you know, remarkable the way that these platforms are able to track you, but um, that's how they do that. And so that's why everybody on, um, on social media, um, their content is suppressed. And so um, that's something that we don't want to do when we don't do a fan base. We want to, you know, we remove the limitation that allows people to um, see your content. And however many followers you wind up with on fan base is how many people wind up seeing your content, either right when you post it or when they come on the app to post it. And, and, and the reason they, the reason they um, are pissed at Apple is because Apple changed the game by allowing you to opt out of being tracked. Mark Zuckerberg yes. the other day was going off on Apple for that reason, because Apple's decision has cost him billions. Absolutely. Um, it's, a, it's a big shift in the culture. And so you're seeing platforms try to offset that um, by asking you, the user, to boost your post to reach people that already want to see you. Yeah, so they want me to pay want me to pay to boost the people who've already agreed to be notified when I go live. Right. Yes. Yeah, so they want you to advertise to your own following, but pay them. Crazy, crazy. Uh, questions yeah. from our panel, uh, then we'll talk about fan base in a second. Uh, uh, let's see, Larry, you're first. Yeah, so I, I guess my question is, um, and obviously, Roland is that you're on the show, you talked about the importance of black tech and what you're doing to fan base. But can we talk about the importance of, of collective, you know, collective economic, uh, combining our economic interests as, as a black community? What are some of the things we need to do as a black community to continue to make sure, particularly as it relates to tech, that we collectively come together, pool our resources to make sure, like I said, corporations like Apple, et cetera, that those are corporations started by us, people look like us, and then we can also, when as it relates to generational wealth. Well, I think, you know, we face a disadvantage in this country by um, our, 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 our suppression and white supremacy that, that you know, have kind of existed with black people. So we have to be intentional about where we direct our energy. Um, we, unfortunately, for someone like myself, who builds an app that is for all people, but I happen to be a black founder, it's assumed that it's built for only black people. And so then they're allowed to limit and marginalize. And so to other people, that doesn't look like uh, some, some place that people want to go and experience and all that kind of stuff. So we have to be very, very intentional about where we direct our dollars. It's very um, a focused effort because we don't own the infrastructures of these platforms that are extremely popular. Like Elon Musk now is a private owner of Twitter. He can tweet, he can treat Twitter however he wants to treat Twitter. It's a private company. He owns it. It's his. Um, he can do with it whatever he wants to now that he's taking it back private. So um, it's one of the reasons why I built fan bases because I feel like black culture contributes so much to social media. It's the economic engine of social media. It's what drives the culture yep. and the pace of what everything does. They, they want to know, like, it's, it's impossible to market and promote anything as being cool without the assistance of black people. You need our music, you need dances, you need slang, you need our fashion, you need us to decide that. But we don't collectively use that in infrastructures to be able to say, all right, now you can run, you can pay money to run through our infrastructure and we give our culture to that. That's one of the reasons, like I said, fan base is a way to share the wealth. It's a way to allow anybody, doesn't matter who you are, it's free to download, free to use, but you can actually monitor your content yourself and be as big as you want to be. There's no limit on the amount of revenue that you can make, being that 7.5 billion people have smartphones on the planet and they can subscribe to you with a couple clicks of a button. So um, if, if people are intentional about supporting platforms like Fanbase, Fanbase's value increases just as much as any other platform by the users that are on it. So if everybody left Instagram today, Instagram will be worth zero dollars and zero cents. If everybody that was on Instagram came to Fanbase, Fanbase would have the exact same value that Instagram has. It's the user base um, which provides the value. So that's understanding that we are intentional about moving our energy and our conversation and our content and our culture over to platforms like Fanbase, Blackstar, um, and, and, and continue to do that, then we can, you know, monetize and support our culture and actually be the, the, the mouthpiece and the voice of our culture and not be filtered through these other media networks. And, and that's why, uh, you know, you had put out, hey, if a million black folks or a million people, period, move over to fan base, you will launch um, a, a, a feature that's very similar to Twitter, and then we can be Absolutely. having conversations on fan base like we do on Twitter. Absolutely. 
yeah, it doesn't take a lot. Like a million people on fan base just allows me to actually um, raise the capital to build exactly what people want. And actually in a relatively short amount of time, probably about two or three months. So that's why I said, like, if we had a mass migration of users to fan base and said, hey, we're going to fan base, set up our profile. And I, I mean, our tech team is savvy. One of the things that I told everybody to do is don't leave Twitter yet. Stay on Twitter. Yep. In fact, stay on Twitter and download your Twitter archive. Download it. Right. So, we, you know, you have your data, you can download all your tweets, download all of them. So whenever we do launch this new functionality feature, you'll be able to upload your tweets to the new platform and it'll be like you just moved over. You wow. just packed your stuff going over. So I tell everybody, download your Twitter archive, tell your friends to create fan base accounts. Come on over. We have audio rooms. There's plenty to do while we build um, that functionality. Right. But come on over and enjoy what we have and then uh, and we'll launch that functionality. Uh, I had somebody, Isaac, ask me, uh, why are you still on Twitter? I said, because I'm going to keep telling people to go to fan base. Yeah. I'm You're like, following. Look, you, you can't get emotional about the way that these platforms treat you. You have earned the following that you've earned, Roland. Uh, you don't walk away from it, right? You keep it. You still continue to use it at your, at, 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 to your advantage to drive people to places where you can connect with them, engage with them, and monetize and do all types of stuff with them. And that's for every user on social media. Don't get, don't delete your Twitter. Don't delete your Instagram. Keep it. Just hold on to it. Platforms like Fanbase allow you to migrate your entire Instagram page. You can migrate your TikTok account over to Fanbase, and you will be able to migrate your Twitter. I've already built, like I said, we, you can already migrate Instagram. So everything stays on Instagram. It just copies it and pastes it over to Fanbase. Everything stays on TikTok. It copies it and pastes it over on Fanbase. So you have to you have to start all over again. You have to start, you know, your content from scratch. <coughs> I wanted to make sure that people have an option, a choice that where they want yep. to spend their time and spend uh, spend posting content. Rebecca. If ad tracking and um, engagement suppression is a part of the business model for uh, Meta, then what is the business model for Fanbase? So Fanbase is a rev share model. So every single person on the platform has the ability for someone to subscribe to them for $4.99 a month. Um, we use in-app purchase technology, and Fanbase was the very first app to allow a person to subscribe to another person using an in-app purchase, like two clicks of a button, and you're subscribed. You're seeing Instagram do that now. You're seeing Elon Musk with Twitter, super follows and Twitter blue, but initially Apple and Google wouldn't allow us to do that. So I take pride in understanding that it sounds crazy, but Fanbase was the first app to allow you to subscribe in that fashion. Not only mm -hmm. fans, not Patreon, but be able to use in-app purchases. For that very reason, Google and Apple take 30, 30 cents of every dollar. We take 20 and pass 50 to the user. So you make, you make $2.50 a subscriber. People can love your posts. Every time someone loves a photo, you get half a penny. I see people make $5 on photos that they would have posted on Instagram and they make nothing off of because someone gave them, you know, a thousand loves, which is $5 in real cash that you can actually deposit into your bank account yep. at the end of the month, right? And so that is our model. It's a rev share model. And I, and I tell everybody, it's the future. When I mean it's the future, there are 7.5 billion people with smartphones. There are only 222 million people that have Netflix. There's only 525 million people on music streaming services. So people subscribing to other people for specific content that they want, that specific news program, that specific cook, that specific fitness expert, that specific comedian is going to be bigger than Netflix and Disney Plus and Spotify and Apple Music combined. So fan base is, is I'm telling the world that if you're not monetizing your content today, Think yep. about this. All it takes is 5,000 people paying you $2.50 a month. You make $12,500 a month. You make $150,000 a year. That's more than 96% of Americans make, and the average American salary is like $47,000. So all you need is 5,000 people, and you'll be making almost three times what you would make in, in the average American salary, but also creating content that you want. And so that's the future of, 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 of content creation and monetization for people. And, and, and the thing is, uh, the, before I go to Joe, the thing is, I mean, look, it, it, it's passive. Like, I'm like, I'm literally just, I, I was just clicking on here, and just right now, y'all go to it. I, I post stuff, y'all. I, I don't, you know, I, I'm not like going crazy, but this is just real basic. I posted stuff, and you see right here, I've got loves. Um, I've got, you know, I made two hundred sixty-three dollars and forty-six cent. Uh, and, and that's just, and again, I, I haven't hit it hard. I mean, that's just, no. that's just passive. I mean, there are times where I've, yeah. I've gone on live and I'm working out 
and folks are giving me loves, listening to my music as I'm working out. I'm literally making money just being live, working out, and folks are enjoying the music. Yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the gift that I wanted to give everybody because um, technology, AI, there's going to be a lot of job replacement. And so people are going to need alternative ways to make income. And everybody doesn't want to do OnlyFans. Um, you're not going to be able to drive Uber that much, but everybody has a skill or a trade and might find that they have a knack or a passion for um, creating really good content or people are inter or being an interesting person. You travel and people want to yep. subscribe to your travel videos and you turn that into an actual business that you can scale from subscription. It's a it's 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 dependable revenue. It's predictable revenue month over month that you can actually you know, uh, change and alter and, 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 and do things to continue to scale that. So and, that's and, I think and, is it. And you're not making anybody do it. It's all up to them if they want to actually do it. Yep, it's not forced at all. Joe? No. Yeah, uh, thanks. First of all, I, I, I'm getting on fan base as, as we speak, so I'm multitasking. But what I want to do is I want to ask you, uh, you know, as it pertains to young folks, you know, uh, is there an age restriction for fan base? And then this larger question, um, how do we go past, kids are so good, young people are so good at, I look at how my daughter operates her phone and all this other stuff, they're so intuitive and they understand Twitch and they understand all of these other things. Past them just understanding it as, as consumers and users, what are we doing and what are you doing <coughs> and what are you encouraging, not only fan base in particular, but in terms of social media in general, to encourage that they get behind the scenes and really start to understand. Now we're different, we're in a paper generation where we were in a paper generation where for me, my thing was Billboard magazine. I started picking it apart. I loved it, okay? I love yeah. the liner notes, you know? So how do we get young folks into the liner notes of social media so that they can be the next Isaac Hayes III? Well, I think, I mean, number one, they really are already there. They're just on platforms that you don't really know about. And, and what I talk about is, is that kids are very, very um, communal themselves. And so I always say that every social media platform has a lifespan. It will live, it will die, right? Um, MySpace is dead. Facebook is a senior citizen. Instagram is a middle-aged adult. Snapchat's a millennial. TikTok's a centennial. And I built fan base for really the centennial, centennial generation alpha, but everybody can use it. And so kids are always going to want to be on platforms that their parents are not on. As soon as my mom got on Facebook, I left Facebook. Their kids right now are going, <laughs> mom's on TikTok. And they're going, oh, mom's on TikTok. We got to move. Like... Where's the next party? Because mom just crashed the party and now she's doing TikToks. And so um, for kids, I mean, they're, they're extremely savvy. My brother, who is 16 years old, my little brother, he doesn't know paper money. He knows Cash App and his step card and digital transactions. And so these kids are extremely savvy. The, the age limit is, is, is the same pretty much on all, all social media. 13 is the, the minimum age to uh, create, a, create an account on fan base. And again, I just think of the, the billions, if not trillions of dollars that are going to be generated by people um, that that monetize their content. And I give this as a warning to anybody that is listening that is in the, even if you don't make content, I'm going to tell you this. If you do not start monetizing your content today in some way, shape, or form, you are going to get out-earned by someone that is less talented than you are that simply decided to do so that decided to put the energy to do so, decided to put the creativity to do so, and it's going to change their life. If there are people that are going to make millions and billions of dollars from monetizing their content, and you're going to say, how did you get so rich? Oh, I got on fan base, and I have 50,000, 100,000 subscribers, and I'm making, you know, millions a year doing so. So, I mean, that's really the point that I tell everybody. And um, more importantly, it's, it's also the ability, what I talk about with fan base, it's also investing. And that's something that, um, you know, we've been allowing people to invest in the platform, and I think it's significant as well. Um, and and I, wanted to, I wanted to share that because we've raised over $7 million um, in equity crowdfunding. One of the reasons why I, I went this way is because it allows the user to actually own part of the platform. So you actually have stock, like stock, like if, if, if you could go back in time, and I'm just going to be hypothetical, if you could go back in time and buy shares in Facebook in its seed round, would you do it? Or, or Instagram in its seed round, would you do it? Knowing that these companies are worth $400 billion, $200 billion when they were worth, you know, 20 to $25 million, $50 million, $100 million. That's the stage that Fanbase is right now. Fanbase is valued at $85 million 
Um, we just crossed $1.75 million today raised. I'm stopping at $2.5 million. It's going to be the final, final round that I allow the public to invest in fan base. When I tell you, if you don't go to startengine.com slash fan base and invest, you're going to regret it because um, this is your opportunity to actually own part of a platform that you use. If you're going to sit on Clubhouse all day and talk, buy some shares in fan base and talk on fan base. If you're going to do dances on TikTok, buy some shares in fan base and make flicks on fan base. If you're going to do skits on Instagram, you know what I'm saying? Buy some shares in fan base and do those things on fan base because now you're an owner. You actually have equity. And so um, we've been very, very successful and I'm really proud to be able to offer that. The largest distribution of wealth to black people in this country was when Bob Johnson sold BET. He made more black millionaires when yep. he sold BET. I want to obliterate that record. I want the one day IPO or exit with fan base because we have over like 8,000 investors. And I want to be standing in a room with 8,000 plus people who are all millionaires, multimillionaires or billionaires who invested in fan base because this is this is what's next and this is what's going to happen. So um, and the minimum to invest in fan base is two hundred and forty five dollars. So you can go to startengine.com slash fan base and buy some shares in fan base for us. Mm -hmm. Buy some shares for your for your kids for Christmas, like yeah. buy shares as a Christmas present, like make it something that you can gift somebody because equity is a gift that can keep on giving and yep. it might change your life in a way that you never could imagine. Well, look, uh, I, I'm an investor in the fan base. Uh, my mama and daddy uh, actually uh, invested in fan base as well, and they 75 years yeah. old. So, folks, don't sit here and act like, uh, oh, that's some kind of age limit. Uh, th this is the thinking that we're always trying to get our people uh, to be at, uh, and that's where it needs to be. Now, we, we played the video here. Uh, you've raised $1.75 million. How much are you, what is your goal for this final round? And as you said, when that's, when that's it, that's it. That, that's it. Yeah, I'm going to $2.5 million. And mind you, we raised this $1.75 million and relatively fast. And when I do programs like yours, we see really, like, spikes in investment, like hundreds of thousands of dollars in investment when I do programs like yours. And so um, it's, it's amazing. And I'm doing, you know, I'm doing a couple other big programs. So that's why I tell everybody, like, I'm going to wrap this thing up before Christmas. Like, we're going we gonna to close this thing down in the next, you know, two weeks. So I tell everybody, call your friends, tell your friends, hey, look, just put 245, 500, whatever, make it a stocking stuffer. Like I said, get it stocking stuffer, like stock, um, and, and, and you know, buy some shares in fan base for, for the holidays. So you're only going to raise... Gonna do it. We actually did a, we did a brand new update today. Um, we have audio rooms that are very similar to Clubhouse and Twitter spaces. You can now pin links, so you can take a URL and pin it to the top of an audio room and have a conversation. So if you're talking about something that you want to promote, you can actually promote it inside the audio room. People can click there and go there. It could be a product. It could be a website. It could be a story, anything you want. So now you can actually use audio as a way to market and promote things that you want people to do. It could be a store, it doesn't matter. So that's a brand new functionality. We have a lot of other really cool things coming before the end of the year. And in 2023, it's Series A time, and that's go time. That's when you raise, you know, in excess of $20 million and, and, and go further. So I want everybody to get in now um, before it's too late. So again, uh, folks, uh, look, when they raise this final 750 grand, that's it. So you can't say yeah. you di didn't know, you didn't have an opportunity. Uh, to hear about it. Uh, we've had Isaac uh, on the show several times now talking about uh, this. And so, look, this is why we have Tech this Talk. Is, Go ahead. You, you know, I don't want to, and I don't, I, I don't think people understand, and I haven't really framed it like this because it, it, it doesn't get covered in this fashion. This is history. Like, there's never been a person like me of color to get this close to where we are now, except maybe Black Planet. We haven't been this close since Black Planet, where a Black founder has built a social media platform, but it's in the modern era where you can actually have people invest in it and own part of it, and then you can actually monetize it if you want to and make money, or you use it for free just to be entertained. And like, you know, I'm the first Black man to ever raise over $5 million in equity crowdfunding. I am, I am an outsider to the tech space. I'm the guy that they don't want to take yep. the culture and the technology and put it under one roof because when that happens, where do they exploit the culture to make money? So I am someone that they are very afraid. That's why everything that we build, they launch and try to copy. Oh, they got subscriptions? We need to do that. 
They got, you can see how fast your video uploads on the platform. They can do that. Like all these things, monetization, we need to do that. Loves, all this kind of stuff. So they see what's coming because they've underserved the audience on social for so yeah. long. And, 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 and the black community is a big part of that. So fan base is something that is, is truly historic. And I keep telling people that like, this is something that's never been done. And let me say this to the people and I've seen your comments. Oh, I don't like this. I don't like that. Go back to Facebook when they started. Go back to Twitter when they started. Go back to Instagram when they started. Every single one of those apps had tech issues and glitches, and you sort those things out. They were not nope. running at optimum level. I mean, Facebook was shutting down computer systems on college campuses. Yeah, but, but rolling. Those platforms didn't even have nowhere near the functionality that Fanbase had. Right. When Instagram came out, Instagram had photos with filters. It didn't have DMs. It didn't have stories. It didn't have live. It didn't have long form content. It didn't have audio rooms. It didn't have monetization. And I like think Fanbase, videos were like five seconds or 10 seconds. And 15 second videos. Like, I'm come, I've come into the game with photo and video, long form content up to two hours, stories that are monetized. Uh, audio rooms that are monetized, short form video, and live that is monetized. It's it's like this is not like I, I and I'm so proud of the tech team and what and what they've been able to accomplish because this is pretty remarkable. And the fact that we've done it with resources that are one one thousandth of what an Instagram or a, a TikTok would have. But when you look at the app and you use the app, you say, this is, you built all this with less than five, six million dollars? Oh my goodness, like, and so, imagine what you're gonna do with 20 million. There you go. Some of these so, platforms they, 13, some so, of these platforms yep. 13 billion dollars. What you think I'm gonna do with 500 million? What you think I'm gonna do with a billion dollars? Like, this is, this is real deal tech right here um, and a real opportunity yep. that, you know, our community and anybody that wants to invest in social media and tech startups needs to take. All right, folks, again, uh, go to Start Engine if you want to invest in the fan base. As I said, I'm an investor. Uh, look, do what we do. Uh, it's important. And again, it's about creating wealth. I keep telling y'all, what did I say on Monday about Deion Sanders? If you're pissed off at Deion, but you're not investing in black institutions, I don't want to hear your mouth. I'm tired of us being the show. Black people, we are the show. Slavery, yeah. those Mandingos, were the show. I'm tired of us being the show. I want us to be the business. The business. I want us to be the Absolutely. business in show business. The business. Because that's yeah. who doesn't have to dance or sing or, or do anything, and they sit back and they actually make more than those who are the show. Can, I, so, tell, can I tell one more yeah, quick go story? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I met Grandmaster Flash about a month ago. And when I met him, the first thing I told him was, the moment you DJed on two turntables and a mixer, somebody should have pulled you to the side and said, do not show anybody what you just showed me. Let's go figure out how to build turntables and mixers. Because everybody that does that is going to need turntables and mixers. Fast forward to 2023, DJ culture is like a nine to $10 billion a year culture but it's owned by Pioneer, it's owned by Techniques, it's owned by Serato. Everybody, to the point that the two turntables in the mixture that DJ, that Grandmaster Flash used, is now a piece of hardware that you can buy. It should be called the Flash 5000, and he should be worth about $6 billion sitting up in some mega mansion talking about I'm the godfather of DJ culture, but that's not the case. We give our IP away for free, then allow other people to conceptualize it, turn it, into an infrastructure and monetize it, and then we're just the gas. But they built the car. Yep. We gotta build the car. We the best gas, we the hottest gas in the universe. Like African American culture is 600 years old. It's the smallest and youngest culture group on earth, but it is the hottest ish in the universe. It is the vibranium, it is the everything that that is. Um, and so if we don't turn our innovations into acquisitions, we are doing ourselves an eternal disservice. 
Like we have to do that. And so I'm so passionate about that. And that's, like I said, that's the purpose of fan base. That's why I tell people to invest. It's like, we can't look at each other as adversaries. You know, um, when Claude Anderson says, you got to pull your money, it's like team power. It's not individual power. You pull your resources and you'll compete. When, when people say, oh, we're not a monolith. No, let's be a monolith. Let's all be a monolith. Let's monolithically support one platform. Let's monolithically, you know, invest in one platform and monolithically support one platform and watch the benefits of that. Facebook yep. made $113 billion in ad revenue in 2021. Ask them to donate $5 billion to the hood and see what they tell you. They're going to say, keep doing them dances, though. But no, we're not going to give $5 billion to Jackson or Flint you know, to fix the water. We're not going right. to put money in inner city communities. We're not going to do that. And, That's and, the purpose. And, and, and what we're going to do, we're going to suppress black news sites so you don't get this yes. kind of information so you can keep on dancing because you're Absolutely. the show. Because you're the show. Isaac, we appreciate Absolutely. it, man. Thanks a lot, folks. Go to Start Engine uh, and look up fan base on Start Engine. Isaac, thanks a lot. Thank you for me having me, Pink. Appreciate, appreciate it, bro. Joe, Rebecca, uh, Larry, I appreciate both, all three of y'all being on the show as panelists as well. Uh, thank you so very much uh, for joining us. Uh, we get out of here, y'all. I am absolutely tired. It's been a crazy, crazy. We, we won't, we've been on the ground in Georgia since last Monday, and I'm talking about going hard, going hard. Uh, but I did. Some of y'all missed this earlier, and I did promise this here uh, that I was gonna play that video again of Chris Paul and Huggy Lowdown. I gotta slap dumb Herschel just one more time. And so this is how we gonna end the show. So I'm gonna say holla right now. Then we're gonna close the show out with this video. Y'all holla, take care. On the first day of Christmas, Herschel made a C. His IQ is negative three. On the second day of Christmas, Herschel made a C. Two abortions and his IQ is negative three. On the third day of Christmas, Herschel Walker made a C. Three death threats, two abortions and his IQ is negative three. On the fourth day of Christmas, Herschel made a C. Four kids ignored, three death threats, two abortions, and his IQ is negative three. On the fifth day of Christmas, Herschel made a C, 5 impersonating. Four kids ignored, three death threats, two abortions, and his IQ is negative three. On the sixth day of Christmas, Herschel made a C. Six years in high school, five oh impersonating. Four kids ignored, three death threats, two abortions, and his IQ is negative three. On the seventh day of Christmas, Herschel made a C. Seven days of shuck and six years in high school, five oh impersonating. Four kids ignored, three death threats, two abortions, and his IQ is negative three. On the eighth day of Christmas, Herschel made a C. Eight, no concussion, seven days of shuck and six years in high school, five oh impersonating. Four kids ignored, three death threats, two abortions, and his IQ is negative three. On the ninth day of Christmas, Herschel made a C. Nine pants on fire, eight known concussions, seven days of shucking, six years in high school, five oh impersonating. Four kids ignored, three death threats, two abortions, and his IQ is negative three. On the 10th day of Christmas, Herschel made a C. 10 for 10, he's lying, nine pants on fire, eight known concussions, seven days of shucking, six years in high school, five.
ignored three death threats to abortions and his IQ is negative three. On the 11th day of Christmas, Herschel made a C. $11 haircut, 10 for 10, he's lying, nine pants on fire, eight no concussions, seven days of shucking, six years in high school, five oh Kids ignored three death threats to abortions, and his IQ is negative three. On the twelfth day of Christmas, Herschel made a C. Twelve months on Trump's nuts, eleven dollar haircut, ten for ten, he's lying, nine pants on fire, eight no concussions, seven days of shucking, six years in high school, five oh impersonating. Kids ignored three death threats to abortions, and his IQ is negative three.